we've talked about blood vessels. Let's start talking about blood flowing through those blood vessels. So blood flow. We're going to talk about blood flow, blood pressure, and some of the factors that regulate blood pressure. So blood flow is the volume of blood flowing through a tissue in a given time. We measure that in terms of milliliters per minute. Just like cardiac output, we're looking at the flow of blood through a tissue. Why is that a big deal? Well, we already know. You gotta take nutrients to the tissues, you gotta carry waste products away. Remember that blood is the delivery system of your body. It is the main delivery system. That is really the most important job of blood, is to bring nutrients to the tissues and carry the waste products away. Um, decreases from arteries to capillaries and increases as the veins get larger. So when the heart pumps blood out into the big arteries, into the pulmonary trunk, the aorta, and so on, the big arteries going down, um, you know, the iliacs, the brachials, and so on, um, as you get further along and you start to branch out and branch out and branch out, the flow is less. By the time you get to the capillaries, it's gone down as far as it goes. Then as it starts to flow back into veins, the veins start to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and the flow increases. So hemodynamics, hemo, blood dynamic, you know, the movement, force, etc. Physical principles of blood flow based on pressure and resistance. That's only what it comes down to. This is physics stuff again. Um, pressure is what moves the blood forward. Resistance is what inhibits it from moving forward. So flow is proportional to the difference in pressure divided by the resistance. Flow is proportional to the difference in pressure divided by resistance. Difference in pressure we're talking about at point A and point B. Blood is flowing from point A to point B. There's a difference. There's a pressure at point A. There's the pressure at point, P, point B. The difference in pressure divided by the resistance gives you a measure of the flow. Now, a lot of that, you know, is not totally critical for what we're going to do. Easy thing to remember is blood always moves from high pressure to low pressure. I mean, that's the way it's always going to work. Um, it's just like water in your pipes. It moves from where the pressure is high to where the pressure is low. So, um, blood pressure, therefore, is the force of blood exerts against a vessel wall. Think about it, blood is being kept inside of the blood vessels. It has nowhere else to go. I mean, assuming that the vessels aren't torn open. So, therefore, the blood is basically trying to push against the sides of the blood vessel wall. That's blood pressure. You have baroreceptors in the major blood vessels throughout your body that detect that pressure of the blood pressing against the, the vessel wall. Baroreceptors detect that. That's blood pressure. So systolic pressure is blood pressure during systole, when the heart is contracting. And diastolic pressure is blood pressure during diastole, when the heart is relaxing. Okay? So... That's what um, you may have noticed already. When they take your blood pressure, you get the systolic over the diastolic. The top number is how much pressure there is when the heart is contracting. Bottom number is how much pressure when the heart is relaxed. Reference value is 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury. Again, an old-fashioned weird way of measuring things. This goes back to the old sphygmo manometers, which sat on the floor and actually had a big tube, a big glass tube full of mercury. And as you've had your blood pressure taken, they, they pump up the cuff. Well, instead of having a little dial on the cuff, they actually had a big tube of mercury on the floor. And the, and the level of mercury would raise and lower in that glass column. So um, 120 over 80 is the standard. Obviously, a lot of people have different blood pressures, and we're going to talk about hypertension, hypotension, and so on. But 120 over 80 is the textbook normal. So related pressures, pulse pressure is systolic minus diastolic. That's basically the difference in when the heart contracts and when the heart is relaxed. That kind of gives you an indication of how well the heart is working. Then mean arterial pressure, MAP, we're going to talk about this a lot, is two-thirds diastolic plus one-third systolic. Why does diastolic get a bigger value? Well, remember the a lot of the... Most of your blood, over half, is in your veins heading back towards your heart. So the arteries are showing a lot of the systolic, and the veins are basically then showing more of the diastolic. So diastolic ends up being a bigger contributor to mean arterial pressure. 
mean arterial pressure of about 70 millimeters of mercury is required to sustain organs. So that's why blood pressure is such a big deal. All the doctor shows you see on TV, they've always got a monitor showing the blood pressure. If that blood pressure crashes, you're in big trouble because you're not going to get enough blood to the organs. And if organs don't get enough blood, then organs start to fail. So that's why blood pressure is so critical. You have to maintain blood pressure, otherwise people are going to die. Characteristics of blood pressure lessens with distance from the heart. So as you get further and further away from the heart, it makes sense. You know, the heart squeezes and pumps the blood out. Well, the blood starts to the force decreases as it gets further and further away. It's just natural. Um, you, know, just, uh, you experience that, I'm sure, in, in life with other kinds of fluids, all right? Arterial elasticity smooths out pressure fluctuations. So remember, we had elastic arteries. They could expand a little bit and then snap back. So see, the, the when your heart is beating, you get that boom, it squeezes, and then it relaxes. Squeezes, relaxes. Well, that would be like jets of blood going through your body if it were just left up to that. The elastic arteries sort of expand, and then they, as they... Uh, as the elasticity causes them to snap back, then they continue to push the blood along a little bit. That's going to have the effect of smoothing out those big uh, differences between systolic and diastolic. And it rises with age, decreases as arteries, um, uh, rises with age and disease as arteries lose elasticity. Arteriosclerosis, the so-called hardening of the arteries. Um, if the, if the artery wall can't give a little bit, then remember, pressure is a measure of the force against the wall. So if the wall can't give, then that's going to mean higher pressure. And as you get older, your arteries get stiffer, and therefore blood pressure naturally goes up with age. You basically can't help it. Even if you try to stay in really good shape, it's going to happen. Everybody gets arteriosclerosis as they get older. So for a typical blood pressure 120 over 80, what is the mean arterial blood pressure? Do you remember how to do that? If not, go back and take a look. Can you do that calculation? It's not difficult. All right, remember it's two-thirds diastolic plus one-third systolic, two-thirds of 80 plus one-third of 120, 53.3 plus 40, 93. Um, so that's fine. That's, that's a typical arterial, mean arterial blood pressure in a healthy adult. Now, my wife has chronic hypotension. Her blood pressure is low, 90 over 60. What's her mean arterial pressure? Let's do that one more time. Two-thirds diastolic, one-third systolic, two-thirds of 60 plus one-third of 90, 40 plus 30 is 70. Remember we said you need to have about 70 just to maintain? Yeah, that's what, that's what it comes down to. My wife's blood pressure is just barely maintaining her, her tissue demands at rest. And that's why anything below that is considered to be hypotension. That's the, that's the guideline, that's the marker, that's the boundary right there, 90 over 60. If you're below 90 over 60, you're said to have hypotension. That could cause problems. You might not be getting enough blood to your tissues. So hypertension, that's where your resting blood pressure is 140 over 90, greater than 140 over 90, often caused by atherosclerotic plaques. So we've seen those before. They build up inside arteries. And um, what that does is it makes it narrower, it makes the, the lumen of the arteries narrower, and then the pressure rises. All right, that's, we'll see that coming up. That's a necessary factor. Um, the pressure is related to diameter, inversely. That can weaken arteries and cause aneurysms. There's one of the potential consequences of hypertension, more likely to have aneurysms. Um, I think that's misspelled, isn't it? I think that should be a Y. Hypotension, that's below 90 over 60. Remember my wife at 90 over 60 was just barely meeting her tissue demands. Um, going lower, you know, blood loss, dehydration, anemia, all those can cause blood pressure to be even lower. So let's look at peripheral vascular resistance in MAP. So peripheral vascular resistance, PVR, proportional to blood viscosity. So vascular resistance means basically what we said before, that blood flow, you know, the blood pressure, the flow, divide, change in uh, <laughs> blood flow, change in pressure divided by resistance. So pressure is what moves blood along, resistance is what interferes with the movement of blood. 
So we're looking now what things contribute to this resistance to the into an inhibition of the movement of blood. Well, the first is blood viscosity. As blood gets thicker and thicker, it's harder to push along. You can think about that. I mean, it's easier. Imagine water flowing through a pipe and imagine maple syrup flowing through a pipe. All right, viscosity means the thickness. So the thicker your blood is, the higher your blood pressure. Also proportional to blood vessel length. So the more blood vessel length you have, the higher your blood pressure is. Now you're thinking, wait, how do blood vessels change length? Well, they don't necessarily, but whenever you add tissue to your body, you're adding blood vessels. All right? It's called angiogenesis. New tissue has to be supplied with blood. Therefore, when you make new tissue, you have to make new blood vessels, and therefore you increase the total length of all the blood vessels in your body. So that's why they say that for every um, pound of adipose you put on, um, you add roughly a mile of blood vessel, and therefore your blood pressure growth goes up. Can you see why if you have high blood pressure, the doctor is going to tell you to lose weight? If you lose weight, then automatically you will lose blood vessel length, and automatically your blood pressure will come down. You can't help it. That's going to happen no matter what. Adding adipose adds length. It's inversely proportional to blood vessel diameter. I mentioned that a moment ago. So in other words, the bigger di the diameter, the lower the pressure. All right, The smaller the diameter, the higher the pressure. We've already talked about this before. Think about alpha-1 receptors. Alpha-1 receptors cause peripheral vasoconstriction, and that increases blood pressure. All right, So that's the main way your body tries to control your blood pressure is by constricting those peripheral blood vessels. And so... Once again, if the diameter gets smaller, blood pressure goes up. If the diameter gets bigger, blood pressure goes down. Blood pressure controlled by vasodilation, vasoconstriction, that's one of the main ways your body controls your blood pressure. And then proportional to turbulent flow. This is a turbulent flow. What the hell does that mean? Well, imagine a, a stream or a river um, that's a nice, smooth, easy-flowing river or stream. Now imagine there are whole bunches of rocks in there that create rapids. All right, that would be turbulent flow. Well, what happens if you've got lots of rocks, then they are resisting the flow of water. All right, and so the same thing happens in your blood vessels. If you have turbulent flow, then your blood pressure is going to go up. What would cause turbulent flow? Atherosclerotic plaques. All right, so that atherosclerosis, as you get those plaques, um, not only are you decreasing the diameter of your blood pressure, of your blood vessel, which makes the pressure go up, but the turbulent flow is also increasing blood pressure. So those plaques, that's why diet is an important thing. Diet may be related to the plaques, and so the more plaques you build up, the higher your blood pressure is going to get. So we already looked at cardiac output before. Go back and look at your notes on cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Well, we can actually get a number for that. We, we calculated that. Remember, we could calculate either you know the cardiac output or we could calculate, calculate the heart rate or the stroke volume. In this case now, we're not going to be calculating a number anymore, but we're just going to be able to tell whether pressure goes up or goes down. So if we take cardiac output times peripheral vascular resistance, the product of those will be proportional to your mean arterial pressure. What does that mean, practically speaking? Well, so remember cardiac output. If heart rate goes up, cardiac output goes up, right? Well, if cardiac output goes up, pressure goes up. So anything that increases cardiac output will increase your blood pressure. So an increase of heart rate automatically raises your blood pressure. Remember we talked about beta-1 receptors. Beta-1 receptors automatically, they raise your heart rate, that will automatically raise your blood pressure. That's a normal sympathetic response. All right, You want blood getting to your tissues faster. So your body raises the heart rate, and that raises the pressure. Then remember heart rate times stroke volume. Stroke volume had to do with several things, preload, contractility, and afterload. Well, think about contractility. Remember, that was dependent uh, on, the, um, on the forcefulness of the beat, All right, the positive and negative inotropes. So... Remember, beta-1 uh, receptors increase contractility. So what happens when you increase contractility? You increase mean arterial pressure. See, so beta-1 receptors do a double whammy. They increase heart rate and they increase contractility 
Each one of those individually will make pressure go up. Both together will really make pressure go up. So what we're going to see now, you have a homework assignment on this where I want you to work through some examples where I give you an example where a person has taken a drug or something has happened to them. And I want you to figure out how that's going to affect their mean arterial pressure. So for example, anything that causes heart rate to go down will cause mean arterial pressure to go down. Anything that causes peripheral vascular resistance to go up will cause pressure to go up and so on. So once again, looking at uh, blood vessel length, for example, when you add adipose tissue, you add blood vessel length. That's going to increase peripheral vascular resistance. Therefore, that's going to increase blood pressure. All right. See, that's, that's the way you look at it. So you got a whole homework on that. I want you to work through those and uh, figure them out. Remember that cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. Therefore, mean arterial pressure is proportional to, we don't actually calculate a number, proportional to stroke volume times heart rate times peripheral vascular resistance. If any one of those three factors goes up, pressure goes up. If any one of those three factors goes down, pressure goes down. The examples I give you on the homework, I never give you one in which it'll make one factor go up and another factor go down. I mean, that happens in real life, but that's too confusing just to do for a homework. So on the homework, all the little scenarios, all the little examples I give you are always going to either make one or more of those factors go up or they'll make one or more of those factors go down. I'll never give you an example where some factors go up and other factors go down. So then there's also local control of blood pressure, so vasoactive compounds, histamine, remember, and bradykinin are vasodilators. So test yourself right now, how will vasodilators affect your mean arterial pressure? Vasodilators will decrease peripheral vascular resistance, therefore they decrease blood pressure, all right? Many wasp venoms contain kinins that cause erythema and edema after stings. There you see a tarantula hawk, the most awesomest wasp we have here in the desert. Fantastic creatures. And that's a male right there. And um, the kinins will cause um, uh, swelling and erythema because they'll cause vasodilation. The kinins vasodilate. That brings more blood to the area. That makes it red. Also brings a little bit of swelling. That's why you get a red bump after you get stung by a wasp. But notice again, therefore, that would make your blood pressure go down because it's vasodilation. Angiogenesis, I mentioned this just a moment ago. When you grow new blood vessels due to exercise or tumors or new adipose tissue and so on, your blood pressure is going to go up. You, you can't help it. As you grow new blood vessels, your blood vessel length will increase and therefore peripheral vascular resistance will go up. Therefore, blood pressure goes up. That's regulated by various factors, insulin-like growth factor, human growth factor, and so on. Right? Growth factors bring about uh, the increase in tissue. There's very big head bonds right there. Jason Giambi, back to the Yankees, a whole bunch of those guys are all taking steroids. When you take steroids, it makes you grow new muscles, and that will also raise your blood pressure. Well, you don't grow new muscles. You make your muscles bigger. Um, then also neural control. Um, so blood vessels in key locations innervated by sensory neurons that send vital information from the periphery to the vasomotor control center in the medulla oblongata. So you've got neurons out there that are sensing things all throughout your body, and they're contacting the medulla. Remember, the medulla is the survival control center of the brain, coughing, sneezing, vomiting, also control of breathing and blood pressure. So... Baroceptors, for example, in your carotid artery and in your aorta, they monitor stretch. And so when they, when, they res when they stretch due to the effects of blood pressure, they send signals to the medulla oblongata, and that can then send outgoing signals to control blood pressure. So the carotid sinus, um, the baroreceptors there communicate with the medulla via cranial nerve number 9, the glossopharyngeal. And the aortic sinus communicates via cranial nerve 10, the vagus. So um, anytime, basically, if your blood pressure is too low, for example, then the baroreceptors in the carotid and aortic sinuses will sense that. They'll send signals to the medulla, and then the medulla will take steps to try to raise your blood pressure back up. What might it do? Might increase your heart rate. Might do peripheral vasoconstriction, see? We want to look at all those factors that affect mean arterial pressure and see how 
the medulla can send out signals that will affect those factors and that will affect your blood pressure. You also have chemoreceptors that monitor pH, oxygen, and carbon dioxide in the carotid bodies and the aortic bodies. Those are all just part of your carotid and aortic arteries, all right? You just have, um, you have two sets of receptors there, one for pressure, one type for pressure, and one type for chemo. And the hypothalamus is going to get uh, signals from those, and it will then take steps to try to um, control. Uh, it'll send signals to the medulla to try to control things like breathing, if your O2 and CO2 are out of whack, pH possibly as well, and respiratory control of pH. So, baroreceptors, chemoreceptors, controlling blood pressure. Then neural motor, so unmyelinated postganglionic sympathetic neurons innervate the smooth muscle cells in the walls of most peripheral blood vessels. We already know this, don't we? They have those alpha-1 receptors we've been talking about. So there you see in the, um, in the diagram the illustration on the lower left, uh, remember the beta-2 uh, do vasodilation of the deep vessels going to liver and skeletal muscles and heart whereas alpha-1 do vasoconstriction of the peripheral blood vessels. This is, again, how your body is going to control blood flow and blood pressure. Sympathetic stimula stimulation of these blood vessels causes vasoconstriction, again, talking about those peripheral ones with the alpha-1 receptors. Blood vessels serving the heart, coronary arteries, most skeletal muscles, liver, adipose tissue, have smooth muscle cells. They have the beta-2 receptors and sympathetic stimulation causes those to vasodilate. Once again, your sympathetic nervous system is going to try to increase blood pressure, but also increase oxygen and glucose. And that's why we vasodilate with the beta-2 receptors, those deep arteries, because we want more blood to get to the heart because it's working harder, more blood getting to skeletal muscles because they're working harder, more blood going to the liver because the liver is going to convert glycogen back to glucose, and we're going to then, therefore, going to get um, more... Uh, more glucose, and then the beta-2 is also in the lungs, causing bronchodilation, so we get more oxygen. And then hormonal controls. So here is one of the most important topics in all of Bio 202. Uh, the nursing school in particular tells us that this might be the single most important topic we cover in all of Bio 202. That's why this is going to be on your first exam, your third exam, your fourth exam, and your final exam. So make sure to learn this. We need to know about, it's called the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. This is our first look at it. Let's look at the particular hormones in this system. So angiotensin um, and AT2. So baroreceptors in the kidney detect low blood pressure, causing the kidney to release renin. Renin is a hormone. Renin, in turn, will convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin-1. Remember, anything that ends in O-gen is a zymogen. That's a molecule that's in an inactive form. This is another one of those liver plasma proteins, all right, made by your liver in your blood right now. You've got angiotensinogen in your blood right now, but it's not in an active form. It'll be activated by renin. And why will renin be released? Due to low blood pressure. So follow this through all the way. Don't lose track. So again, if your blood pressure drops too low, you have these baroreceptors in the kidney. In response to a decrease in blood pressure, they're going to release renin. Renin will therefore convert all the angio... Well, it'll convert the angiotensinogen in your blood right now to angiotensin 1. You learned this, by the way, in Bio 201. I know you did because the SLO or CLO at the end of the semester tested you on this. Angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, um, converts AT1 to AT2 in the lungs and the adrenal cortex. So... AT1 by itself doesn't do a whole lot. AT1 needs to be converted to AT2, and that's when the magic happens. AT2 is a powerful vasoconstrictor. What's that going to do? Remember, vasoconstriction. If we decrease the diameter, that means the blood pressure goes up. So, boom! Immediately, blood pressure now already is going up. Then, aldosterone. Aldosterone is the save sodium hormone. Think of it that way. I'll remember, always remember aldosterone as save sodium. Um, increases sodium retention, so it increases water retention. Wait, why does that happen? Hmm. Sodium, all right, a contributor to osmotic pressure. What do we know about osmotic pressure? What's the little thing you memorize that always solves 98.7% of all osmotic pressure problems? Water 
follows solutes. So what aldosterone does is it works in the kidney. It causes your kidney, instead of dumping sodium into the urine, it causes the kidney to retain sodium in the blood. Well, if you retain sodium, that means you'll retain water. And if you retain water, what's that going to do? That's going to increase your stroke volume, all right? If you increase the total amount of water in your body, you'll be increasing the total amount of blood in your body. Therefore, you'll increase preload, right? Remember the three things that affected stroke volume? You'll increase preload because you'll have more fluid. If you increase preload, that increases contractility. That in turn, I mean, that does not, increasing preload increases stroke volume. And increasing stroke volume increases blood pressure. So once again, we've got a way to raise the blood pressure using aldosterone. Save sodium. We save the sodium. That caused water to follow. More water means greater stroke volume. That means greater blood pressure. And the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, the RAA system, or the RAAS for short, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Then also antidiuretic hormone. So what we're what we're doing here is that angiotensin II um, is a powerful vasoconstrictor. Angiotensin II also promotes the release of aldosterone by the adrenal gland, uh, uh, the adrenal uh, cortex in particular. We'll see that when we get to the uh, urinary system, and it also increases the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary up in the brain. You learned the pituitary in Bio 201, remember? hung down from the hypothalamus. So whereas aldosterone is the save sodium hormone, antidiuretic hormone is the save water. Diuresis means peeing. So antidiuretic means it, you don't pee. Once again, this is the kidney that's doing this. The kidney is going to take water that it normally would have put into the urine, and it's going to save it into your blood. Well, if you save it into your blood, that means you're going to have higher stroke volume, Therefore, you'll have higher mean arterial pressure. Increases blood volume and pressure. So that's the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Here, then, is another hormone that is completely opposite. So don't mix those in with those. Don't mix this one in with those. ANP, totally different. ANP, remember that is the always need to pee hormone. ANP, always need to pee. So this stands for atrial natriuretic peptide. So atrial means that it's released by the atrium. It's released by the heart. Natriuretic, doesn't that mean it's, it's natural? Natri, natural? No. Natriuretic, remember natrium is the name for sodium. That's why we abbreviate sodium as Na. Natriuretic, that means sodium in the urine. So what happens here is that if your blood pressure is too high, so all everything we looked at up until this point, angiotensin, angiotensin II, aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, those all raise blood pressure. Now we're looking at ANP, which is going to lower blood pressure. So if your blood pressure is too high, then baroreceptors in the atrium are going to detect that. They're going, then the atrium will release ANP. ANP will travel to the kidney... And what's it going to do when we get to the kidney? It's going to cause the kidney to put sodium into the urine. Well, remember, again, osmotic pressure. What do we remember that solves almost all osmotic pressure problems? Water follows solutes. So the more sodium you put into the urine, the more water follows. And if you have more water, that's going to lower your total blood volume. More water in the urine, that'll lower your total blood volume. That, in turn, will lower your stroke volume, and that in turn will lower your blood pressure. So see homeostasis here. You've got these three hormones that are raising blood pressure. Then you've got this fourth hormone that lowers blood pressure. So your body has got a hormone for whatever it needs. If your blood pressure is too high, blood pressure too low, your body has hormones that will take care of either one. Unlike ADH in the RAA system, ANP lowers blood pressure. Don't forget that. That's very important. Keep that in mind. It's the opposite of angiotensin II, aldosterone, and antidiuretic hormone. And then neurohormonal control, norepinephrine and epinephrine. They stimulate, vaso one, uh, stimulate um, alpha-1 receptors, which promote vasoconstriction in most vessels, especially the peripheral ones. They stimulate beta-1 receptors that increase heart rate and contractility. 
They stimulate beta-2 receptors that vasodilate those deep arteries to skeletal muscle, liver, and cardiac vessels. So look at all the stuff we have there. We have lots of things that are uh, affecting blood pressure, making it go either up or down, and they involve the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. They also involve the adrenergic receptors. This is time to make like a big, take a big piece of paper and make some charts and draw this all out. Put all this stuff on one big piece of paper where you see all the adrenergic receptors that are relevant in this case and the renin angiotensin aldosterone system along with also ANP and just make a big you know, graph, chart, table, whatever to keep all these things separate. All these different factors that raise and lower blood pressure, all right? Now, homeostatic control of blood flow. Um, here's another uh, potential um, factor for um, controlling the flow of blood in your body. Under autonomic nervous system control, arterioles will shift blood flow with changing priorities. So I love the pictures here. The picture on the left, there's a guy with a beer belly sitting on the couch with a beer. God, that's just so, doesn't that remind you of your dad? What'll happen is, like, after a meal, when you're relaxed, when you're sitting around, I mean, anytime you're relaxed and sitting around, you don't really need a lot of blood going to your limbs, do you? But if you're putting food and things like that in your body, then you do want um, blood flow going to your intestines and so on. So, um, stomach, I mean, for digestion, etc. So, that's blood shunting, all right? So your autonomic nervous system will automatically shunt blood to where you need it. So after a meal, it takes blood away from your extremities and shunts it to your intestines and stomach and so on. And then look over on the right-hand side. Oh, isn't that awesome? They, it's, they have an integrated soccer team. There are people of color and white people playing soccer together. Let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya. So, but notice what's going to happen here is that when you're exercising, when you're active, well, you don't need to digest right now. That's not as important. Um, so we're going to shunt blood again, moving it to your extremities and constricting the blood that's going to your intestines. That's why, right, after a big meal, you don't want to go out and exercise. That doesn't make sense. Um, you know, you're, you're basically getting in, but food sit in your stomach, and you may end up feeling kind of sick to your stomach and so on. You don't want to exercise and digest at the same time. You know, after a big meal, wait a little bit before you go out and play soccer with your um, integrated team. During exercise, blood shunted away from internal organs to heart, lungs, and skeletal muscles. After eating, the opposite occurs, okay? And um, there, um, just to kind of a show you where most of your blood is at various times. See, um, control of blood flow, you're moving blood to where you actually need it, okay? Blood distribution changes to meet demand. Note that cardiac output also changes dramatically, all right? So exercise, look, up at, you know, 17 and a half liters per minute at rest, 5 liters. We already knew that at rest, 5 liters per minute. So again, you know, the more active you are, the more you have to perf perfuse your tissues with blood. Therefore, cardiac output has to go up. Okay, here you go. Which of the following causes a decrease in blood pressure? ANP, ADH, renin, AT2, or aldosterone? Four of those cause an increase in blood pressure. One causes a decrease. There you go, A and P. Make sure to make that big table or chart or diagram or whatever you need. Keep all this stuff straight. All the adrenergic receptors, all the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Make sure you know which things raise blood pressure, which ones lower. You know, in your chart, make sure to put in there all the factors affecting peripheral vascular resistance. There were four. Do you remember them? Vasodilation dilation and vasoconstriction. Do you remember the other ones? Blood vessel length, right? So blood vessel diameter, blood vessel length. Do you remember the other ones? What were the other two? And peripheral vasoconstriction, turbulent flow. Remember turbulent flow? And the last one I'm going to relieve is an exercise for you.